the question, what does an educated person look like? I think the answer, your answer to that question partially lies in the text of that speech. And it's very interesting. It's very passionate in exactly the way that Amber was speaking about. And she spoke about it. In, in fact, she sounded like exactly your kind of person, uh, 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 really. Um, but I couldn't help feeling, once I'd read through that speech, whatever the nobility of its objectives, um, when you looked at what it thought a good education consisted of and an education person consisted of, I felt that I was back in my North London grammar school in 1969. That's how I felt. I felt I was looking at a curriculum which was the O-level curriculum and that the EBAC was essentially the O-level curriculum, the demands that were placed upon you by universities at that stage, that the teaching methods were the same as I would have uh, mm. undergone in that school in 1968 to 1969 and so on. Um, how do you answer the charge, essentially, that your notion of the educated person is really the grammar school educated person of 1970? Um, I think the best way of answering it is to look at those countries that are most successful educationally now. And of course, <clears throat> you can define success in different ways, and we might go on to explore whether um, some versions of success are too narrow or exclusionary. But if you look at um, those countries that have improved their education system, or if you look at those um, regions within nations that have improved their education system, then there are certain things that stand out. I was in Poland a couple of uh, weeks ago. It's the country which has got the most improved education system in Europe. Um, and the one that's narrowed the gap between richest and poorest fastest over the last 10 years. Um, and the approach that Poland has taken is uh, give or take a, a, a couple of uh, peculiar national quirks, the approach that I outlined in that speech. I think it's also going to be the case that if you were to look at um, the most successful East Asian nations, which have been uh, capable of getting their people to a, to a very high level educationally, they'd have done the same things. If you look at um, uh, the province of Canada, Alberta, which has the best results um, academically anywhere in the English-speaking world, they do similar things. And if you or I were to go to visit um, one of the schools in the United States, which has been most successful in closing the, the attainment gap between rich and poor and getting children from backgrounds that wouldn't ordinarily have thought that they were going to go to college, to go to college, you'd have found something similar. And even if you went here in London to those schools which are most successful, you'd find the same thing. And I think that what lies behind your question and what is a legitimate question is uh, the extent to which people think that those of us on the right are hankering after selection and that when we talk about academic education, all we're really concentrating on are the needs of a minority. And I think that that's the biggest problem in, uh, or has been the biggest problem in English education over the last 20 or 30 years, that we've always thought that the point of education at some point was to sort people into the academic and the non-academic, um, and uh, as a result, we've missed a trick which other countries have, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, transcended. Um, we've always been trying to think, how can we get people on the right track at the earliest possible stage? And other countries which have been more successful have said no, more children are more capable of learning and knowing more um, than we've, uh, the, we've hitherto thought, um, and that the, uh, the well-educated society of the future is one in which more people do academic education for longer. I, I just want to uh, ask that point. That, as a proposition, mm. sounds, in, in, uh, in terms of its ambition, very similar to uh, the idea that Labour had that comprehensive schools should be grammar schools for all. Yes. Yeah, well, but there was a gigantic problem with that, mm. which we're going to come to, which we're going to come to in a moment, mm. which was, you described very well the business of getting a number of children who at the present probably underperform or the, their potential is not realized within the current system, uh, and uh, allowing them through a better examination system, through a better curriculum system, to achieve what they need to achieve. Now, the problem I'm talking about doesn't lie with those. Because actually, by and large, you know, the people just above them succeed fairly mm. well. We can talk about whether they're coasting or not. But there is a very large number of children who don't fit into that category. In other words, we're talking about those that we usually talk about sending on vocational tracks and so mm. on. In other words, exactly those who the GCSE system attempted, and maybe grade mm. uh, uh, inflation attempted, 
to, if you like, uh, incentivize into the system, mm. to bring them at some level of contact in the system. So here's the worry. The worry is that they're going to lose out, not because you don't have ambitions for everybody, but because the ambitions you have don't actually suit anything they're likely to do. Well, I, I, and I challenge that, um, and I, I, I disagree. Um, I think that there are, there are going to be some students, and we don't know how many, but I think very few, actually, who wouldn't be capable of following a full academic curriculum, a general curriculum to the age of 16. There will be some students who are living with cognitive or neurological impairments that make it extremely difficult. But the lesson of the most successful education nations and the most successful schools in this country is that you can have 80 or 90 percent of children capable of following a general academic curriculum to the age of 16 um, and capable of reaching the sort of standard um, that uh, we thought that perhaps only a quarter of children were capable of reaching um, when you were at grammar school in North London. Yeah, okay, so, that's, so that in a sense begins to answer the question, not of what <coughs> the education per person looks like, but of objective, which mm. is that 80 to 90% can indeed yeah. achieve this uh, academic curriculum. Yeah. What, what in your terms does that um, uh, mean in terms of, in rough terms, of what we could anticipate, let's say in 2025, 2030, 80 to 90 percent of our children achieving at 16? Well, I think that uh, they should be able to um, use the English language in a way that means that uh, uh, none of the interactions that we expect of um, um, an adult are beyond them, that they can um, uh, draft documents, write business letters, interact with uh, bureaucracies at the same time, that they um, have uh, read um, uh, and appreciated English literature, which takes them out of themselves and tells them something about the human condition rather than simply replaying to them um, uh, aspects of their own existence. It means that they'll have a fluency in another foreign language, which will enable them to, um, to, to, to have a, a basic conversation and basic interaction with someone from another culture. And it means that they, uh, mathematically, uh, they will have an understanding of uh, chance, risk, probability, um, and uh, the arithmetical processes that mean that um, they can uh, buy an insurance policy, um, uh, listen to Robert Peston on the news and not be confused. Um, <coughs> I know that's asking a lot, but still. Um, I, I think that's post-doctoral. Post-doctoral, possibly. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and, and similarly, in scientific terms, that they, they, they have an understanding of broad scientific methods so that they're not likely to be taken in by... Uh, the scares that someone might run on something like MMR. They'll, they'll understand why it makes sense um, for, um, for everyone to be immunized. So it's that sort of general education. Um, and I, and I, I don't think that's pitching things too high. Funnily enough, in terms of pitching things, I did some research earlier. Um, this was something that was written in the 1970s by a professor whose wife was a secondary modern teacher. Um, and this is what this professor said. Um, a prize for anyone who can guess which professor it was, actually. Um, an educated man well, the 60s, so they're, I'm afraid, irredeemably sexist, but still, must have a certain minimum of general knowledge. Even if he knows very little about science and cannot add or subtract, he must have heard of Mendel and Kepler. Even if he is tone deaf, he must know something about Debussy and Verdi. Even if he is a pure sociologist, he must be aware of Circe and the Minotaur, of Kant and Montaigne, of Titus Oates and Tiberius Gracchus. Now, that is what, in the 1960s, people expected an educated person on leaving school to know. Now, even I think that's pitching things a little high. But um, the, the point that I would make is that um, it's only if you're ambitious that you can um, ensure that children uh, have the sorts of opportunities which uh, allow us to see just what they're capable of. And one of the things that I'm always conscious of is that um, if you underestimate what children are capable of, and this, I think, was one of the great problems with selection in the past, um, then you condemn them to a track, which means that they, they never have the chance to flower. No, I, I, enti I entirely understand that. I mean, f the strange thing about this is that um, your impulse, the, the objectives you set yourself, would have been very, very familiar mm. to a British communist of the 1950s. Yes. And you're abs uh, that's absolutely true. Yes. Uh, how much of a compliment that's supposed to be, I don't know. But I mean... Well, the, other, the, other, the other canonical <laughs> text that I have here... Um, the Lost World of British Communism. I did know that, by the way. By, by Raphael Samuel. <clears throat> and and, and the reading it, I, mean, I, I was going to say, one of the things here is that the culture, I mean, it put the ideology aside, the culture of the British Communist Party of the 1950s, I find, I have to say, perhaps just like myself, wholly admirable. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but there's a bit here. Well, that is, uh, for the journalists who are here, yes. that is a great quote for yes. tomorrow. No. <laughs> <laughs> the culture, I mean, because there's a page 198, talks, um, um, Raphael Sama talks about the religion of books. And he says, the library in any communist home was always the prize exhibit in a party member's home, a kind of secular shrine. Yeah. Fantastic. No, it's, 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 it's absolutely true. And when he was cultural secretary of the Communist Party, my father wrote a pamphlet about all the things in the English literature and mm. so on that you have. And it, it laid out a series of canonical texts. Mm. But one of the things it was always in counter and opposition to was popular culture. Yes. It was in continu In other words, it posed continuously the idea of the canon against the idea of the popular culture. And the reason why I'm raising it in the way that I do uh, comes back to your saying, so this is your objective. Um, we'll come back maybe in a moment to how we would measure whether you had attained your objective mm. in 2025. In other words, the examinability or testability that you'd actually, uh, uh, that you'd actually reach that stage. But it comes back to the question of, uh, the, the, uh, of how you see things like examinations and teaching yes. methods. Because when I talked about the 60s and 70s, what I was thinking about was that was the era of the O-level and the single three-hour examination. At the end. Now, no problem for me. Um, I cherry-picked the O-levels you had to have in order to get the ones, discarded the ones that you wouldn't need to have because there was no AS level system uh, back then. That was one of, the, uh, one of the kind of changes. And I could do the three-hour exams and walk through. And that was the way in which we were taught. Um, but the price that was paid in subjects that you were not good at was one of abject boredom. Mm. I was the top historian in my school because I entered into the classes the most interested in history, and I came out the top in history at the school. I know that the people who sat in the same classes that I did, listening to and, and, and being asked to write down everything that was in history, I talked to them now, they found it an utter bore. I'm not at all sure that any of them went on to learn very much from the history that they got as a result. One of the things that you're... <coughs> that, that you're Concentration on examination does, and it says it quite explicitly, as you build up the building blocks by which you then progress. Mm. But in a lot of these subjects, nobody's expecting to progress. And I'm worried that you're not allowing for sufficient development of what you might call critical faculty in the curriculum, as opposed to the things that you would need to know as building blocks in order to pass exams in subjects you will then not progress in. I think that I mean, it's, it's such a good series of points, really. I mean, it, it, we, we take, take, the rest, take the rest of the day. Um, <clears throat> I think the first thing is, more often than not, um, uh, students are bored in class um, if the, uh, the teaching isn't good enough. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the teacher isn't good enough. You're right. A poor curriculum um, and the wrong sort of assessment can constrain what a teacher is capable of doing. But there's no reason intrinsically why some form of external assessment can't ensure that the critical skills that you talk about, the critical thinking skills that you talk about, are actually embedded both in the method of teaching and in the method of examination. Um, I quoted a, in the speech that you kindly referred to, I quoted an American uh, academic called Daniel T. Willingham, and he makes the point that um, it's through developing an understanding of a body of factual knowledge and how one bit of it relates to another that you develop critical thinking skills um, and that you can't have critical thinking skills learned um, uh, without developing that, that familiarity with the body of knowledge. But I think your, your, your tougher challenge for me is the method of assessment that we've always had in the past has tended to favor um, the retention purely of information and it has allowed exam technique, Helen Bennett parodies this brilliantly in the History Boys, to trump proper love of learning. But I think that you can develop, and we are developing, ways of assessment which are external, so they don't rely on the, the subjective judgment of teacher and, 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 and pupil, but which do give you um, an appreciation of what someone's been capable of doing um, um, and, and how well they've been taught and how much they understand and how uh, critically they, they think. Oh, and just one other thing. To go back to one of your earlier points, you talked about um, the vocational. We might go on to this in greater depth, but sure. there's always been a problem in England in that we have simultaneously said that vocational is for those who are not academic and then implied uh, but never really clearly stated that that means that we think that they're somehow less able overall. If you are going to have genuine parity of esteem between the vocational and the academic, then you have to ensure that vocational work is examined as rigorously, and that means that, for example, um, if you are uh, examining someone's uh, skill in cookery or in 
uh, uh, here in beauty or in electrical engineering, then you have to set them a, a time-limited task during which they have to perform um, uh, certain functions and show flair and skill. Um, so in that sense, the uh, demand that there be external assessment of how well someone has done something is what our culture has led us to believe is a way of conferring on a particular subject you know, the, the status of excellence. No, that's true. And without it, people yes. won't believe in your capacity to do something, and what other, yeah. and what other way have they, have they to do yeah. it? Except that the three-hour examination is not always the, I mean, it's I, not and you, co you cover that, and you cover it in the speech, it, it, it's really interesting. Though you talk about the pleasure there is in mm. passing examinations, you don't deal with its corollary, mm. the, the necessary other thing. Yes, the which, pain. The pain there is in failing them. Yes, well, I, I think that's I mean, one of the reasons we've had great inflation is essentially because there's been an impulse to give children, moral, if you like, kind of moralize children to the system by giving them something that they are a bit more likely to pass whilst actually giving them an objective to, to, to meet. Yes. And, and actually, I, and, and, and this is the thing that teachers stand accused of now. Mm. What you've done is you've let standards slip a bit without recognizing that the reason why some of that had to happen was that you were trying to get a lot of children interested in the system, you might otherwise just say, this isn't for me. Yes. You, you, you failed me. Because, no. in other words, alongside the pleasure of passing exams, Michael, there's the pain of failing them and feeling that you're a continuous failure. Yes, no, you're, you're, uh, you are right that um, uh, if you, um, as Lord Tevitt said in a different context, if you give a dog a bad name, I was talking about the coalition government, um, then um, it plays up to the bad name that you give it. Um, and if you, if you say to someone, you're a failure, mm -hmm. then that can have a devastating effect. Um, but at the same time, it, it, students know if they are um, being rewarded for unmerited success. You think? Yes. And I think that people know that tasks have to be, um, I think the word that I used um, uh, in the speech, or the phrase that I used in the speech was at or just above their expected level. People know when they've, uh, they've scored their personal best. Um, and it's part of the role of the teacher in order to help people arrive at a sense of what it is that they can do and then make them feel a, a genuine success at having passed things. And I think there are two things there. It is undoubtedly the case that for a student who might never have thought that they were going to secure a GCSE pass, securing AD can be an amazing achievement and one of which they and their parents can be proud. But at the same time, it would be unfair to that student to say that that D pass would mean that they could then um, uh, move seamlessly on to uh, a particular type of job or a particular type of um, further education. Um, it's an achievement, but it's not necessarily the, the, the passport that um, um, a B pass would be. And I think that all of these judgments require, require care. You, firstly, you need to be capable of motivating a student, and it's not just exam passes, there are different ways in which you motivate a student, but you also need to be clear to the student that if they expect to go on to um, achieve success in other fields, then there is a slightly higher bar that they're going to have to clear. Um, and you've also got to be clear to the student that while you will work hard to identify the level at which they're capable of working, you'll expect more of them. You will encourage and support them to do more than they thought they were capable of. Uh, incidentally, it's quite interesting to me, and I would have done the same if I'd been you, to contrast the D student mm. with the difference and achievement with mm. a B student. Mm. Had you chosen contrast ability with the C student mm. that you didn't choose to because for the, of, the, mm. of the very obvious problem, which is there becomes a mark at which a yes. D becomes a C, and on that one mark turns the difference between whether or not yes. the student is any good or not. Now, one of the things you could argue that mm. you should be able to do more of is to be much more flexible about moving students between grades subsequently. Well, uh, In other words, mm. to reevaluate where people stand. And one of the big problems we always had with the grammar system, mm. in addition to all the other problems, was the utter inflexibility of the system. It permitted no real judgment about how children were changing or pupils were changing. Uh, and the fact that they might become good at something that they hadn't been good at before. And this is also complicated, as teachers know, by the fact that we test people quite often at the worst hormonal stage in life to do any such thing. Yes. I mean, it all happens at the wrong time, doesn't it? 
lots of things happen at the wrong time. As, as if I could think back to my teenage years, lots and lots of things happened at the wrong time. However, um, uh, the the point you make about um, <laughs> okay, we might go to that later. The point that you make about um, uh, the the cliff edge between a D and a C, as it were, is, is reinforced by two things, both of which we're 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 thinking about and trying to change. One of them is the fact that. Um, uh, many, but not all GCSEs at the moment, um, have um, uh, foundation and advanced tier papers. And that means that um, students are, uh, they, they sit um, a paper which achie where achievement can be kept to the C, or they sit a, a paper where obviously you can go up to an A or an A star. The very fact that you're saying um, you're a foundation tier student and you're an advanced tier student is a hangover from the, 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 um, the situation that you identified and which I've said that I'm opposed to. Now, there are some people in the teaching profession who say it is almost impossible to design any form of external assessment which will capture the full range of ability. Uh, but I'm challenging that at the moment because I think that there are ways in which you can capture the full range of ability within a, a set of papers or exercises. But I'd be very interested in, in people's views about how practical that is. And the reason why I think you should do that is for precisely the reason that you mentioned. Um, there's a broader point, problem, though, with the CD borderline, which is that um, in this speech I talk about how important it is to have data about schools that are performing well so we can learn from them. You know, the, the, um, you wouldn't um, uh, allow a drug to be marketed unless it had got, undergone randomized control testing. We should, in education, look at those schools that succeed and learn from them and rely on data rather than conjecture. Therefore, you need to have um, uh, externally set and marked examinations, but the concentration on the CD borderline has meant that, that teachers, because in some cases they've had little option, have put too much attention on students who are on that borderline and getting them from D to C. And that means that some of the very brightest students haven't received the stretch they need. And some of the students who, at that stage in their lives, are weaker, haven't received the support that they might need. Um, I don't think there's a perfect way of judging schools, but I think there are better ways um, than we have at the moment. And again, we're consulting on how we can get that better. I should just tell everybody that. Um, 15 minutes before the session's due to end, we're going to open this up for questions from the floor. Uh, and I took a fair number. And as you can tell, the subject is so um, uh, dense and interesting that trying to cover all the subjects or even a fraction of them is, uh, 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 is incredibly difficult. I mean, we've concentrated in a way. I mean, I, I, I interpret what you're saying because I th it, was, it was said that you wanted to return to a two-tier examination mm. system and only the nasty Liberal Democrats stopped you from doing it or the wonderful mm. Liberal Democrats or however you want to characterize the Liberal Democrats in this yes. context and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but the way in which you've described what you want to do would not allow of such a possibility. And the, the, this is, um, I, I, one of the questions that, I, that I'd asked um, <clears throat> internally within the department was, in Singapore, not an ideal state in many ways, but a state from which we can learn certain things. Well, I was going to say, how much lesbian poetry do they teach in Singapore? <laughs> well, I don't know if Lee Kuan Yew is a, a, a huge fan of sapphic anything. Um, but um, but never, nevertheless, you know, as I said earlier, no country's perfect. Um, but in, in Singapore, they have managed to ensure that something like, you know, more than 70% of students are capable, not necessarily at the age of 16, some of them do it a year later, of sitting an examination, which is an O-level. And that O-level is designed and, uh, um, you know, set uh, here in England. It's, you know, it's, a, it's an examination which is put together by people in Cambridge and set by people in Singapore. And I thought, if that examination, which is, you know, unambiguously um, uh, uh, aspirational, can be set by so many people in Singapore, surely we can make our examinations here and indeed our whole school system more aspirational. But as soon as you mention the word O-level, people automatically think of the CSE. Mm. Um, and understandably, um, they, uh, th th that sort of uh, division is simply another way of recreating the problem, which I think that we've, we've, exactly. we've always had. And therefore, my question, uh, internally and externally, has been how can we ensure that you have an examination which is simultaneously more challenging because you expect everyone to do better but also which captures um, uh, the majority, overwhelming majority, of the ability range. Um, it comes back to, you know, one of the, the challenges that we have at the moment, which is that um, uh, only uh, um, less than 60% of students in, uh, in the country at the moment get five A-star to C passes, including English and Maths at GCSE. So 
there's still a way to go. But I think that unless you set ambitious goals for the future, as they have in other countries that have done well, <laughs> then you end up treading water, and then other countries end up uh, generating the sorts of um, advances in, in education that leave you and your, um, your citizens languishing. When, I mean, what, one of the things that's uh, going to determine uh, whether any of this works is what is you actually decide to do yes. in, about vocational education. And I mean, when are we expecting what? Well, we, we've, we've said and done some stuff about vocational education, but one of the things is um, that, uh, again, one of the, the issues that you sometimes get in, the, in, in England is that people talk about vocational education and its importance. And then when you say, okay, I'm now going to explain, you can see the drowsy eyelids. Tony Blair once said that if he wanted to declare war on Iran, he'd do it in a speech headed skills training, mm. because no one would notice. Yes. I think, exactly. And, and, and you know, the, the, it's, it's probably unfair to, 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 to well, th this is one audience it might be fair to ask. But um, uh, Alison Wolf published a report on uh, vocational education, almost all of whose recommendations we're implementing. Mm. But some of the, the, the things that you need to implement in, in order to improve vocational education are, unless you are fascinated by education policy and it's going to be shite, very dull. So you need to change the program weighting of post-16 funding because at the moment, um, the mixture of success and retention criteria incentivize further education colleges uh, to offer less rather than more demanding courses in order to rack up a large number of passes in subjects which do not necessarily, or in courses which do not necessarily translate into productive employment. Um, but uh, if we were to have, you know, if, if, if we were to advertise... How would, you put that, how would you put that into plain English? Exactly. Um, well, in, in plain English, um, you should... Um, well, what we've done is every student over the age of 16 should have uh, some cash, and he should be able to say to uh, the school, um, it doesn't matter what you teach me, you're going to get the same amount of money, but you have to tell me which of these courses are more likely to get me a job or more likely to keep me... Um, in education for longer, and then I'll decide which of these courses is right for me. There is, there, there, is, there is an obvious overhanging problem with that, which is whether or not vocational work should be job-specific or should be skill-centered. Yes. I mean, uh, mm. because, largely because we can't predict which jobs are going exactly. to be big in 10, 15 years' time when somebody sets out on that. Uh, that is, on that that is absolutely true, and, and one, of the, one of the problems there is that we don't even know necessarily which skills we might think are going to be useful in the future. And when we've tried that, um, for example, in an area that, is, that crosses the academic and vocational, the ICT curriculum, the ICT curriculum that we developed is now out of date um, because it was essentially about using applications, which all of us are now familiar with. Sometimes our children are familiar with them um, by the end of key stage one, so by, you know, by the age of seven or eight. Um, so we've, we're making some changes to the computer science curriculum. Um, but you are absolutely right that um, it's not only the case that there are some jobs which now exist which won't exist in the future, there are some um, uh, generalized skills which we now value which will be uh, redundant or obsolete in the future, but nevertheless, the, uh, the application required in order to master a particular set of skills and the sense of satisfaction that comes from having done so um, you know, with um, uh, authority um, is a sign to a potential employer that you've got you know, grit um, and um, uh, determination. Um, and that you're the sort of person whom it is worth taking a bet on. So sometimes, even if the occupation itself may not survive 20 or 30 years hence, occupationally specific education can be helpful. It does strike me that such a system is going to require a lot of resource, Michael, a yes. lot of educational resource. Yes, I, I'm, and um, I, mean, I, I don't want to be party political um, um, about it, but one of the good things about um, having the Liberal Democrats um, in the coalition is that they've helped me um, to make the argument that we need to um, uh, keep education well resourced. And of course, you, know, you, you can have a broader political debate about the extent to which um, the government's um, uh, program is wise or unwise. But within that, I don't think anyone can deny that the Department for Education continues to be one of the better funded um, uh, departments. And the, you know, the reason for that is, as I say, that um, uh, you have a prime minister who chose, when he was in opposition, to be an education spokesman for his party, so the issue matters to him. Um, and you have in Nick Clegg and David Laws and Vince Cable, uh, politicians who 
chose at the last election to put education at the center of their... Um, uh, their Sorry, I'm beginning, I'm beginning to glaze over at this point. Sorry. <laughs> you do that. That's, it's not a Tory party conference speech where you have to no. introduce all your colleagues. And, uh, <coughs> exactly. I'm sorry. No, no, you're I, quite right. I'm sure you do it only out of, uh, out of politeness. I'm going to very quickly, before mm. we take some questions, mm. uh, cover two other issues, which, um, which came up a lot, an awful lot, mm. when I asked people for questions uh, yes. towards the, 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 the mm -hmm. session. Um, and the one of the most obvious ones, and it, it comes up again and again and again, is that when you have a system like the EBAC, which says certain mm. subjects are core, then certain subjects don't become core. Now, mm. in the art subjects, and also within things like our, uh, within subjects like RE, that mm. say, actually, we build up some of the very things that you really, and in, and in the changing world, actually do, you do need, we find ourselves out on the edge. Why, for instance, is it more important for people to study geography mm. than to study religious education, uh, given the sort of world we live in, unless you make religious education a peculiar adjunct to geo mm. geography teaching, which I suppose you could. I, and this is a complete anathema to everybody, I think that you cannot survive in the modern world without media studies. Mm. I don't see how anybody can. Um, I think the story we were being told earlier on about the person who learned that her husband had collapsed over Twitter um, uh, at a previous event here was a kind of perfect example. Now, I know also from old discussions there is no perfect answer to that, but I think the least maybe you could do mm. is to share your realistic worry about the same subject. Yes, no, I, I think that um, one of the interesting things whenever you open the Pandora's box of saying that we're going to have another look at the curriculum is that uh, there are uh, passionate and brilliant people who make a plea for almost everything. Um, and you have people who will make a plea, for example, that we take food technology out of the design and technology curriculum um, and that we have cooking and we introduce that separately. And, and w when you listen to that argument, you say, yeah. um, and then there are others who argue that, um, uh, uh, that natural history and indeed in one case gardening would be part of the curriculum. Media studies, um, I disagree with you, but I can completely understand why um, uh, some would make that case. Um, RE, there's a specific factor and that is that um, religious education is already a mandatory part of the, the national curriculum, whereas geography and history are optional. And to change that architecture would mean pulling at the, um, um, at the current tapestry too hard. Music, um, and for that matter, dance, art and design, been, drama. I never noticed you being reluctant to pull at the tapestry. The, <laughs> the, the, there's, there's a point where um, if you give it too big a yank, everything can um, um, fall down. So I've been, <laughs> thank you for that. Right. Thank you. Well, well, we'll come on to that point in a moment. Um, but um, I, um, uh, I think that really, for a variety of reasons, politicians shouldn't talk too much about religion. Um, and I've uh, deliberately thought that we should keep religious education as part of the national curriculum. We should keep the requirement for um, uh, worship um, as part of um, assembly and just leave it. Don't go there, is my view, for a variety of reasons. Um, but with uh, geography and history, um, I noted that there was a decline in the number of um, students who were taking these subjects, as there was precipitately in modern foreign languages. And I also looked at what happens in other countries and what their general curriculum to the age of 16 is. And the English baccalaureate is essentially a, uh, uh, an encapsulation of what other countries, which have been educationally successful, do. Um, these are the, the subjects that students will study in Germany and in Poland, um, in Australia and in Canada to the age of 16, um, with some sort of slight alteration um, uh, at the edges. But what would, I am- What I, would we do with our international comparisons? Well, I, I, <laughs> I think- No, I make them all the time myself as yes. well, but it is, but, but, but actually there are so many countries out there that one, I, I yes. and I hadn't realized that Poland was becoming to play such a central role. <laughs> well, I was, I was going to say that, um, um, I, there are lo lots of reasons why I love Poland, but um, the, the, the reason to pay attention is because of the, of the facts. Uh, you know, in the same way, um, I made the argument about league tables in an earlier context, sometimes there are schools that can surprise you because of what they do well. Um, and I'm, I'm just as much a fan of comparisons within the UK as outside it to see what we should do well. But I was just going to make one final point about music. Um, and that is that um, you know, if, there, if uh, it does... Uh, exercise me that too few students have the opportunity to learn um, music to a high level in this country um, and we have 
and I, I can run through all the sort of political things that we've done, but I know I that there is more to be done, um, uh, specifically on music, um, and um, uh, I don't believe that the answer is necessarily mandating um, uh, more, ma mandating centrally more curriculum time. I think it's looking at those parts of the country and those schools that have been most successful in integrating music into the life of the school. Okay. I was, I was going to ask you one of, the, one of the things that comes up all the time, which is the balance between your um, uh, stated desire for mm. greater independence for the profession yes. and yet the profession's uh, perception that it is actually being told what to do as much as it ever was. But I think I'm going to leave that one to come better formulated, sure. uh, possibly from the audience. So if we could bring up the house lights. We're going to take exactly 15 minutes for questions, I think... Is there a possibility to bring up the lights? Because otherwise I won't be able to see who's asking a question. Yeah, that's better. Michael, you may have to help me um, mm. uh, a, a little bit here. And do we, can you show me where the mics are? There's one here, one there, one here. Right, you haven't got one, so you can't ask any questions. Uh, yeah, you can. Chap over. So um, I'm going to take them in batches of three, and the obvious thing is going to apply. If you've got a speech to make, go to a conference. Um, Let's, you, can, you can make very tight questions. You teach your pupils how to do this all the time, so uh, that will be good to, to, to follow that. Okay, who's first up? There's a chap, I see a chap right in the middle there with a grey blue shirt. Um, and a green middle. badge? Is that yeah. helping, I'm wondering? Keep your hand, whatever you do, don't put your hand down. Yeah. In a t-shirt? Yeah, yeah, in a t-shirt. Yeah. And as I said, we'll take them in batches of three. Well, I think um, just starting with exactly what you said you were going to ask, which is, you know, you've come to the Institute of Education, there's loads of people getting trained to be teachers here, and yet you seem to show a complete disregard and disrespect for our profession by undermining, you know, um, our employment rights and pretty much everything we're doing in terms of the curriculum um, and all of our... Um, employment rights and pay structures through academies program you know everybody knows what I'm talking about um, and my question is particularly to do with the academies programs which you haven't touched on today at all which is okay, how sorry you sorry sorry I'm gonna that's a second question I'm, we'll take your 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 main thing as your first question and if somebody else wants to ask the ac academy question we'll get to them uh, i'll take somebody from over here is there a hand up in the left hand block there's that's that's very helpful when you do that you mentioned you mentioned at the beginning that you can define success in many ways could you please tell us what how you define it what is success for okay. uh, year 13 students coming out of school, for example? What is success for? School leavers. OK, thanks. And the third one, I think, from over here, right down at the front, if we may. Um, no, Claire, I can't have you ask a question. That's ridiculous. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The person behind. <laughs> I do beg your pardon, but otherwise everybody would think it's a, a friend's show. <laughs> My question is about um, assessment and, and whether you're aware of the analogy of weighing the pig doesn't make it fatter and how you, how you think that um, having harder exams actually equates to higher standards in, in actual learning. Okay, there's three there for okay. you. Um, on, on, the on the first point, the gentleman at the back. Um, the Academy's programme has been um, good for teachers' employment rights um, and positions. Uh, teachers, and academies are teachers and academies are paid more than teachers in other schools, even though they're on average younger. Um, uh, it's why, uh, if you look at academies, they are... Um, we have a representative of an academy chain here, Lucy Heller. I think she will probably confirm that every time that she advertises or in one of her schools advertises a vacancy, um, that a disproportionate number of students want to work in those highly successful schools. And why not? Because academies are schools in which teachers are in charge, where head teachers have the freedom to design their own curriculum free from my interference or anyone else's interference, um, and where different methods of uh, teaching and learning can be pioneered. Um, the resistance to the academy's program is, uh, uh, I find, uh, increasingly uh, the province of, of people who um, want to 
swim close to the edge of the pool rather than striking out into the center of it. Um, and um, um, all I can say is uh, if, you, uh, if you come on in, the water's lovely in the Academy's program. Um, and I know, I know that you and other professionals, once you've had a chance to work and operate in an Academy, will never want to go back. Um, on the point about... Um, Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I've never yet met um, uh, an academy principal who'd want to go back. Um, on the question of what success looks like, I think that um, there's a phrase that I've used. Um, I don't think I've used it so often yet that it's become a cliche, but it may be in danger of becoming one, which is that students should leave school um, capable of being authors of their own life story. And what I specifically mean by that is that um, uh, for most of human history, what you do when you leave formal education has been determined by the class or, uh, you were born into, um, or by your geography, or by your parents' occupation. I think that what education should enable uh, uh, a young person to do is to decide what they want to do with their lives, to make them sovereign. Um, and that means I, I ran through a range of skills earlier, which was not exhaustive, but indicative. Um, and I personally believe that success means that you have someone who is um, uh, a master or mistress of um, uh, bodies of knowledge which allow them to sift good arguments from bad in the public square, which allow them to appreciate beauty wherever they encounter it, which allow them to question arbitrary authority or irrational decisions, and which allow them to take the uh, um, uh, uh, increasing number of opportunities that 21st century capitalism is giving to us all um, and use them to, uh, to their own personal benefit and the benefit of their community. So that's a definition of success. Um, and then on the final point about assessment and weighing things. Um, well, you can't have education without assessment. Because you won't know what people have learned. You cannot have education without assessment. No, but we need to know. Um, and um, okay, hands up those people who believe you can have education without assessment. Well, I think, I, I, well, we know, I, I, imagine, I, I imagine we're talking about externally ex external set and Externally set and externally marked exams. Formal external assessment. You can't have education without that. Well, actually, let's carry otherwise, on. Your... Uh, otherwise, it's just play. Michael, let's carry on with your poll. Yes. <laughs> let's. No, no. Well, okay. that, well, let... I'll hand over to David to do Well, no, no, no. Well, well let, mm -hmm. let, let, let's see. I mean, we're not a representative sample. No, OK, but we have a representative sample here. Yes. Um, you, I, I, well, I, I've answered it, I, I think, very directly and bluntly, which is that you absolutely need assessment. You cannot know... What? Sorry? Uh, he's saying the question is, do, are harder exams... Oh, yes. ...to make the, the exams actually harder... Oh, yes, of course. ...mean better assessment? Um, I think making the means, exams means harder is a sign of um, a higher ambition, yes. I think they, they absolutely should be, because it's only when exams are genuinely tough and demanding that you get the most out of students and the most out of schools. Okay, so that's, that, that's the proposition. I imagine you don't agree with that. Um, and I imagine that will be the subject of discussion. Um, we're going to take three more. <coughs> I, there's, somebody, mm -hmm. there's somebody right at the back with a light shirt near the back, about three in the, in the middle, who is straining so hard to get a question asked that I can't... Uh, sorry, I mean, effort is quite a lot here. <laughs> I just want to make sure she's got it. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, um, earlier you mentioned about specific examples that you have in um, England uh, where schools have taken an academic route and 80 to 90% of students have achieved. I'd like to know what those specific examples are. Um, I oh, no, will. We're going to take them in twos and threes, Sorry. Michael. Um, uh, yes, uh, is, there, is there any section of the hall that feels I'm not looking at them? Oh, okay, you do. You obviously do. And, uh, there's some semaphoring going on here, which is, uh, which is quite productive, yeah. Um, you started talking earlier in the conversation about um, not condemning young people in their ambitions and letting them have a chance to flower and also um, ensuring that vocational work is examined as vigorously as academic work. My question is, therefore, why have you decided to exclude arts from the EBAC, which hasn't been... 
which is, I think, a massive area which hasn't been covered today. And I think surely that's exactly what you are doing. You're excluding people's chances by excluding the arts from the EBAC because they don't have a chance to be assessed in the same way and to have equal qualifications. And surely you're promoting a hierarchy of subjects. Absolutely got it. Um, and is there anywhere else that we feel... Yeah, I didn't look down here. There's going to be the, the, the lady right at the front. I'm so, I apologise to those of you whose my eyesight have, uh, have not got round to... Yeah. Bonjour, Monsieur Goff. You talked earlier about um, the absolute acquisition of the English language and another foreign language. My question to you today is, what about the community languages? Do you think they have to be put at the same level? Community languages. Community languages. So, for example, um, uh, yeah. there, there are people in Britain who um, yeah, I, I think I Urdu, that. Bengali, I just, Turkish, I just, I just have never heard Welsh. that expression before. It's my fault. No, 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 not, not yours. Uh, my okay. Fault. So um, those. Uh, the, 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 these questions, I suppose, in a way, are interrelated. Um, firstly, um, the schools that uh, uh, get eighty or ninety percent of their students doing well. Um, well, one of them, Mossbourne Community Academy, is one of my um, favourite schools, Paddington Academy which is just below the sort of 80% uh, level, which is a ULT school. They're schools which do brilliantly. And one of the reasons they do brilliantly is because they have high aspirations right from the very beginning for all of their students. And it's also the case that there are primary schools which have students from uh, very challenging intakes that get every student at level four, which is the sort of standard or accepted minimum level of literacy or numeracy. Every student is at that level or above. So we're entirely capable of doing it. There's a marvelous phrase which I used in the speech I gave earlier this week from Andrew Adonis, which is, um, uh, how many good schools do you have to visit before you can be convinced of the educability of every child? Um, and these schools prove it. It goes on to another point. Sorry? Well, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I, well uh, 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 so, uh, actually, sir, no. not everyone does have high ambitions for children because not every school is doing as well as those schools. Okay. I, know, I, know, I know, I'm terribly sorry. It's part of my responsibility to point out that there are schools which are inadequate, um, and the people running those schools clearly do not have sufficiently high ambitions for the children there. Um, well, well, okay, okay, I mean... well. You, you, may, you may disagree, you may disagree but, but it is manifestly the case that there are schools which are not good enough in this country. Okay, question two. Um, question two, related point about arts and the EBAC. Um, the hierarchy of subjects within the EBAC, as I mentioned earlier in conversation with David, was one that was arrived at by looking at what happens in other countries. But simply because we demand that there should be a strong general curriculum up to the age of 16, that doesn't mean that you exclude the arts or music from what makes a successful school. Let me repeat another argument that I made on Wednesday, which I know will be unpopular with some people here. Um, some people say that there are schools which are exam factories. Some people say that there are schools which are sort of grad grinding institutions, which may get good GCSE or A-level results, but they're prison houses of the soul, and they don't have any good music or arts provision and they certainly don't play a part in the broader community. I've never met or seen anyone going to such a school because those schools don't exist. Schools which have good academic results and good academic standards are also the schools that take arts and the music seriously, that uh, take the arts and music seriously, have great live performances, have choirs, have orchestras, have a commitment to cultivating the whole child. And it's those schools that disdain academic success that, to my mind, tend not to have the cultivation of the whole child, I, both the academic and the cultural at their heart. Can I ask just a quick, a quick question? Is, therefore, my perception of the Singaporean education system entirely wrong? Um, I thought it was, almost, it was like that, but maybe I... No, no, no. no. Well, one of, the, one of the striking things about the Singaporean education system is the rich mix of um, after-school clubs and extracurricular activity that characterise the most successful schools. Okay. All right. Well, um, that's the and, then the, and then the final point about, um, about community languages. Um, the more languages that um, um, our young people speak, the better. But I think it's important that we recognize that they are introduced to languages which um, take them beyond, simply, the, um, uh, the experiences with which they may have grown up. The whole point about studying uh, modern foreign languages 
or indeed the classics, is to expose yourself and your mind to another way of looking at the world. Um, and so for that reason, I think it's important that we should um, encourage and support students to uh, study those languages, which unlock the door to, to different cultures. Okay, I'm afraid that's it. Those were excellent questions, and I'm very grateful for you uh, for asking them, and I'm sure that the Secretary of State is, um, and the manner of your response. Um, can I thank you very much for coming and being such a great audience now, and the Secretary of State for staying such a long time and answering. Thank you. Thank you.